intellectual and sol solidarity economy. She is currently associate professor in the Department of Economics at the University of, Ker of Kerala. Tin Tinran Van Tan Tan Puran. I am so sorry. I tried to ask her, and I've been practicing, but to no avail. Um, she is the founder of uh, Dicey Diverse uh, Solidarity Economy uh, Economy Labs in India, which is funded by the University of Kerala. Her educational journey began with a Master's of Arts degree in economics from the University of Kerala in 1988 and completed a Doctor of Philosophy, a PhD in economics from the same university in 2004. Noteworthy among her books are titles like Women Empowerment to Capacity Building, The Role of Microfinance and Inclusive Growth Through Social Capital Formation, um, Is Microfinance an Effective Tool for Targeting Women? She is co-editor with Carolyn Shanaz Hosen of Community Economies of the Global South, Case Study of Rotating, Saving, Credit Association, and Economic Cooperation. She is recipient of a KN Raj Fellowship on Research Grant for Researchers and Economics from the Center for Development Studies from Sitiran Van Pan Tampurin and publication um, grant from the Indian Council of Social Science Research. She has been awarded um, research funding from agencies, including the University Grant Commission, Kerala State Planning Board, ICSSR. Kerala Council for Historical Research, et cetera. Um, this event is presented by the Harriet Tubman Institute and the York Center for Asian Research. Uh, the speaker was invited to Canada by the Dicey Dice Collective in the University of Toronto. So the talk today is in, uh, entitled India Solidarity Economics, an Indian Feminist Understanding of Roska, Self-Help Groups, and the Kundam Bashri uh, System in Kerala. Uh, in the solidarity sector, and this is just a little abstract, so we know what we're getting into, very excited. In the solidarity sector, India is well known for self-help groups. This ability to mobilize groups is no easy feat in a country with a population of 1.35 uh, billion and hundreds of languages and ethnicity founded by caste, class, and such identity. There are various forms of cooperative, for informal and formal in India. In India. Part of the diverse financial economy includes CHIP funds, a rotating saving and credit association, ROSCA, uh, and this uh, system is both informal and regulated. Kerala's expertise in self-help groups and mutual aid with innovation such as CHITS and Kundam Bashri has earned the state a rightful place as a leading expert on cooperative development. The talk will be based on an Indian feminist understanding of the wide variety of solidarity system in India and how they affect the lives of the marginalized section of society. So please, everybody, help me give a hand to introduce Dr. Christabel Peter. Um, social. I, I can I can change this. Yes, this is yes. okay. Oh, fine. So, okay. Let me set up your presentation. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah. Everybody, thank you. All of you who have joined here and also in uh, first of all, I'm so happy and excited to be here in your university with the community who is there in your community. So I'm also happy to join my uh, co-writer in the lab room and also uh, Saliva, I think she will be joining very soon. And Professor And my dear student, Lejo, here. Donna, Chakri, Priyanka, and yeah. So uh, I'm so happy uh, to be here. And I would like to share my experiences. For, for the last 25 years, I'm working on uh, the solidarity sector. Uh, I started with microfinance, then later I, I started looking into 
the different forms of solidarities which are there in the in the different uh, arenas of activities, especially in agriculture, in industry. Because in India, we have a lot of experimentations on uh, collectives. So if you want to uh, in, uh, enhance agriculture, the farmers' collectives uh, were initiated. So in order to make the industries live, especially the traditional industries live, industrial clusters were initiated throughout the country. So uh, my focus was over the years, uh, mostly on the solidarity economies and how it works and how is it happening in at the grassroots level. Because you know, as a development economist, I can say that always the literature uh, says uh, the development happens somewhere else in the in the industries or in the in the MNCs, and uh, that development. Uh, when I when I when I was a student of economics, we used to be taught that that development would be trickling down to the different sections of the society. So that was not happening. Uh, that is our experience when when we start to our research and we when we go to the field and see the communities uh, where they are, what are they doing, and the development. Uh, as far as they are concerned, is much different than that of what is given in the or written in the textbooks. So I try to look the whole thing from the from the the alternative perspective that what the development means for for the for the people who are really eager to come out of uh, their poverty or for poverty level or or the marginalized marginalizations which are there they belong to. So that that was my my. So, uh, some acknowledgements I would like to make, especially at the University of Colorado, uh, which uh, which funded my research, and also uh, my my travel. And I'm here as a uh, as a member of Dice Collective uh, because uh, we some of us are together in order to. Initiate some research on diverse solidarity economies throughout the world, especially those those who are there in the global south. So uh, that uh, that collective is there, and because of that collective and other other research activities, we are we are with the book, and uh, now is also a part of it. Saliva is also a part of it. We co-edited a book uh, along with uh, Carolyn Shanasos, and it was a wonderful experience in order to uh, understand what is actually happening across the world as far as the rotating savings and credit associations are concerned. So I co-edited that book as well as I, I contributed to that book uh, uh, by, by, by the two. So, so back in my, my country, uh, river, my university, me, all the facilities of uh, wind research, administration, and also Kerala State Planning Board. I am also a member of the working committee of the policy making body of Kerala, 
and we, we tried to contribute uh, as much as possible for the for the betterment of the women in in Kerala. Uh, otherwise, uh, the Kerala uh, Kerala uh, uh, Council for Historical Research uh, it is funding me to do some research on indigenous financial mechanisms like chit funds and so on. Uh, then Kudumbashi uh, is. Uh, 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 also uh, funding uh, me a lot. Come to the contents like this. Uh, very, very basic kind of a uh, thing. I'm not going in very deep into any something like that. So I'll be I'll be uh, starting from India solidarity economics. So let me induce. The, the concept of solid economics that is about we are interested
you in the form of uh, help uh, in the consumption and also in the production process, it is helping in a lot of ways. And you may give to your of a friend or a brother or sister that is actually sometimes you know a group may come and help a help a, a friend uh, at the at the locate so that kind of uh, very informal kind of institutions are happening uh, and also the rotating uh, savings and credit associations which I may, may elaborate a bit in the in the downline and also we can see a lot of co ownerships uh, and also collective ownerships uh, likewise you know uh, in in Kerala we, we, we can see a lot of experiences on community supported agriculture because you know Kerala uh, has a history of a declining agriculture sector where uh, people abandoning uh, abandoning uh, land because you know land uh, is becoming because the real land, uh, is coming up so nobody is interested in and the people come together, they created the fallow lands. That is the interesting part. It is not land is with power. out there uh, and also uh, uh, but I love how to run so that on uh, uh, and and When you when you go through this list, you can see that some of them are very much informal. Some of them are documented makers. Everywhere the so that actors, I think, the people who are the of that institution yes so now uh, India uh, they are in the abstract world Linguistic minority, that kind of things, this kind of things are there. So, uh, a lot of people is there. Still, you know, in that diversity, you can find a lot of these groups that is, uh, the solidarity is alone, uh, well laid. I should have been. In the over through the that the
So let me start with uh, one of the. Yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> uh, sorry for all the glitches. Yeah. Uh, the first one, which I, which may, which I, which I, which I give a very, very short uh, uh, description is about the ROSAS, that is Rotating Savings and Credit Associations. We have the book. It is about the different different case studies which we have across the world, like uh, Brazil, Vietnam, Thailand, India. So uh, we can see a variety of uh, collectives, uh, that is martial collectives at the grassroots level, they are the ROSCAS. So what they do is that uh, uh, the ROSCAS, they do the resource pooling among the, among, the, uh, among the members, and also they approve economic gains. Naturally, they have the economic gains because, you know, they get a port because everybody is contributing uh, into the port. And at the same time, you are saving. At the same time, you are borrowing from that particular uh, particular uh, group, so that you know uh, you are you pulling the resources that will help you to gain something from the uh, from the process. It can be social gains and also the economic gains. And uh, we can see that the collectivism model, because you know the people are coming together. Those who are from different uh, different uh, parts or different sections or different households, they are actually uh, actually characterizing the social organization because they, there are some norms, there are some tr trust, there is some trust going on uh, between the members who are engaging in that particular uh, Roska system. So that kind of, uh, kind of system is still there not only totally in uh, in uh, in the in the global south, but also we can see some of them in the most most uh, modernized Western civilizations. And uh, we can see that if we look into that kind of uh, institutions, they are there in the marginalized sections of the society because you know they are outside the purview of the financial formal financial institutions. So across the world, especially in Africa, in Asia, in South America, if you find a number of uh, variants of uh, rose dust. There are they are, they are, uh, they are known a with different names, Ikub or Suhu or Tonti now had the bath in different different parts of the world. So but at the same time when we to uh, come to India, you can see uh, that again a lot of variants is there in Indian context. Uh, and we uh, even in in a small province of Kerala we call it as uh, some Cheat or uh, cheat or uh, in in Tamil Nadu they call it doctor. They find the variety, the evolution which you can see uh, and how how uh, worked on it in very ingenious manner according to needs of the day in order to uh, make the things. And uh, when I did that, uh, uh, probing through the history. Um, uh, actually, this uh, this rose become very famous because uh, the money, especially uh, the the for the people. Uh, with uh, uh, the rice with husk and also with uh, so, so. Uh,
you are supposed to give it. So that methodology is, is happening. In some of the cases, the auctioning system is there. But in many of the cases, uh, the auctioning may not be there. Maybe if it's a very close community, that community will decide to whom uh, that money should go. If a person is in a crisis or something like that, that money will go to that person. So it is the methodology. Generally, it will be based on auctioning. Still, you know, there are variants we can find at the, at the grassroots level. So uh, we can we can see that uh, it is uh, it is seen uh, among the lower as well as the middle class because you know the middle class even though they have some economic resources but at the same time you know they may need big money at times like uh, conducting a wedding or or building a house or something like that or, or buying a vehicle so they also engage in this kind of activities likewise the business class are very much uh, involved in this activities because uh, because they know that it is very difficult to get loans from the financial institutions if they are doing very petty business or, 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 or trading business or something like that. For the money is an inventory. So they need money at a, at a regular basis. So they also envision these kind of businesses. So uh, what we can uh, generally see is that uh, those who are, are excluded from the former financial institutions, those who are not in a position to have an entry into the financial institutions at a, at a, uh, at a very easy manner. So they are really in these kind of institutions so that you know they will get the resources whenever they are. Okay, so this enable the financial inclusion of the marginalized communities because I'm I, uh, I'm insisting that thing because I'm an economist and uh, I'm I'm a financial economist because financial inclusion is an important thing that is what they always will. But I know that a lot of other benefit uh, is also there because you know yes, society is there a community is there to help you kind of uh, that kind of support system is there. It is an indigenously nurtured, developed financial institution. But at the same time, if you look at some of the literature, especially media, that media is not projecting these kind of informal institutions in good manner. So uh, especially uh, when I when I met them, so There are some uh, cheating that is happening in this kind of institution. So what they do is that when, uh, but what, what they're trying to say is that when the institutions are becoming more and more informal in nature, that is, that is uh, not that much civilized or that is not that much accept acceptable in nature. But uh, that is actually looking from the point of view of, uh, of the, uh, of the capitalism or something like that. But you know, when you, when you, when you turn your, your or, or change your them, that is the most important thing in their, in their life. And they are that even there are even if they are still the people are believing in the kind of institutions. So that is why I, I always have a question. Even though this much financial institutions are there, a lot of financial uh, pitch and it are existing in the in the local, uh, especially in the global south. Uh, so, uh, but it, you know.
there should be some regulations, some rules. I'm not always for that high high level of formalization. Still, um, like yeah, for at the end, even though the formal is different, but the movie uh, my on. Women are coming together, they form uh they are in in the in the south uh global south in eighties it started in different Yeah, groups are only for only meant for women because you know it is uh, the, the microfinancial institutions, the private microfinancial institutions use this mechanism in order to harass the women and uh, and it is it has become a huge business nowadays. So that is a, a negative part of uh, self help groups, but at the same time, you know uh, what what we can see over the decades, maybe for forty years or fifty years, that is still there. At the grassroots levels, and and who are the members of that uh, self help groups? They are the women, and uh, and you know the group mentality is happening, and group liability is there because if one person is not paying back the loans, the other people will be pressurizing that person, so everyone will be uh, liable to get give back the money. So that kind of uh, methodology is going on. That's and you know why these groups are still there. I I say I will say that it is because of the money involved in it. Uh, because if the money, uh, if you take away the money from microfinance, uh, the groups are going to collapse. Like that I I very much I know that. Still, you know, a lot of other things the microfinance institutions can uh, can 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 do. So uh, many many of them have been uh, facilitated by the government. Uh, many of those are by the non-governmental institutions. So the characteristics are. Uh, it is very small loans. But nowadays, when I visit the groups, uh, what I see is that the money which they are getting is something like 50,000 or one night or something like that. That is 100,000 rupees. That is big amount. And that is actually making the uh, women uh, over indebted. That kind of that kind of issues are there at the at the local level, uh, and uh, always the repayment periods are very short, so that you know uh, the money will be uh, will be uh, paid back uh, in a very short period, maybe in a period of one year or two years or something like that. So there is group contract, and the self help groups will be vetting the loan applications, and they have some standardized practices in order to. Uh, keep all the records and auditing procedures are there and uh, that kind of uh, that kind of methodologies they have already uh, standardized and that is making the uh, making the groups to go forward like you know if a person is coming late for the meeting they will charge some fine so they will be very uh, <laughs> Uh, very much, uh, you know, uh, alert of the time of the meeting and that kind of things are very much standardized over the over the years. It is not, uh, it, it it is not happening in one day or two days time. So uh, usually, when it comes to the microfinance, we can see that the high repayment rates are very high. So again, from that point only, everyone started looking uh, it as a business. So if the repayment rates are very high, the banks are interested in it, the uh, the private financial institutions are interested in it, everyone started uh, getting interested in it. Yeah, so, and also uh, it is some uh, small informal organizations, uh, which are uh, which are between 10 to 20 members. But when I started doing my research, uh, the group uh, will be 40 or 45 or 50, uh, members. So they usually have always quarrel. Uh, they quarrel each other because, you know, uh, we get the, because, you know, they have to protect the loans. 
uh, and uh, when the loan loan come to you, it will be it will, it is taking a lot of time. And later, it is again that number is also getting standardized, like something like like twenty numbers and so on. So uh, earlier, uh, it used to uh, be called as micro credit only. The credit component had very important role, but later when we go to the uh, field, uh, the people, especially the old women, they they give very much importance to the savings. Now I have 5,000 rupees in my in my past book. So if something happens to me, uh, I'll, I'll get good <laughs> good funeral or something like that. That kind of that kind of um, um, uh, responses we can we can get from the field. And for that uh, no that is a great thing you know that savings part uh, is something like an insurance for the women who are from the uh, from the backward regions. So uh, savings is an important thing. Then credit is also there. Uh, many of the many of the groups they they convert it into micro enterprises. So uh, the most important thing is that these women they uh, once they were not considered as bankable. Later they were considered as bankable and they are also financially included and a lot of actions it's not the financial actions but also the other financial actions also undertaken so i just want to uh, uh get your attention on this particular table especially in the last last column only okay so how many people are engaged in these activities so the huge number of people are uh, are, are are amassed or mobilized in order to uh, to make each program work in different parts of the world. So uh, 10 million people is not a small number and they are there in that institution for a long time. That itself is another important uh, thing. So a lot of institutions are still working at the at the grassroots level in order to help the people who are there at the uh, at the at the local settings in order to help them to tide over their difficulties. So I'd like to give one interesting uh, case of India, where these self-help groups, uh, they are linked to the to the banks. So that was, a, that, that was a huge program, which has been initiated by the National Bank for Agriculture and Urban Development. Actually, that is a, 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 a subsidiary institution of the Central Bank of India, that is the Reserve Bank of India, in order to give importance to the agriculture and rural development. So they only uh, started getting interested in the self-help group movement. And even in 1992, very, very early itself, they, they jumped into this uh, particular program and they had the women to get linked with the former financial institutions. Uh, uh, earlier, the nationalized banks uh, were showed some interest because they were very much reluctant to take the uh, take the loans and the savings of the of the women because the women usually were excluded from the former financial institutions. Now, uh, now the group has a has an account with the bank and the bank keep that savings with them and they will be monitoring the group for six months based on some performance indicators. If the performance is good and the, and the group is viable in nature, then the bank will give uh, credit to the to the women. First, it will be in the form of one is to one um, uh, uh, ratio, then they will increase if the, if the people, if the self-help group gives back that uh, repayment in a, in a regular basis. So uh, you can see that uh, earlier, why the women were not, not included, because if you uh, if you keep separate bank accounts of 20 women, the transaction cost as well as the uh, bank is very high. But now uh, the transaction cost has come down because 20 women is there in a particular group and the bank need only keep one, one account for each group. And the repayment uh, level is also very high. So they are very much interested in this methodology. So uh, we can see from the data, it is about 8.7 million self help groups are now linked to the uh, to the to the bank. So if you multiply it with 10 or 15, you can see how many people are involved or included in the banking system in a huge country like uh, India. So uh, that. That was the idea behind this particular program. They could enhance uh, the financial inclusion part. 
And when we look into the literature and we, when we go to the uh, to the field, we can see that a lot of impact uh, happened because of uh, the the presence of SNGs among the women at the at the uh, at the local level. There, that is about the reducing poverty. Because as a, as an economist, I can say that poverty is not only in the poverty. Poverty has uh, multidimensional uh, features in it. So uh, different type of poverty uh, has been addressed by the self help groups in a in a in a in a in a in a long time because you know it started in 25 before 25 30 years in many of the regions and they are still going on and they are working uh, among the people who are there at the grassroots level and also uh, gender participation uh, has been increased in different kinds of activities it can be you know uh, when i started my field work i uh, my uh, my respondents my bed, the people who are there beneficiaries of that self sort of groups they used to say tell me that earlier we used to be at home we don't have any place to go out so the women started coming out of the houses and they started engaging in one activity or another activity so the mobility of the women increased that itself is a great change uh, which took place at the at the local level so uh, that participation of the women in different activities uh, enhanced over the years and uh, that even had some dynamics at the ho household power and some people they, they they take it in a very negative manner because you know the the women started taking more responsibilities the men become more lazier that kind of Case studies are also there. Yes, we can see that. Still, you know, the power started uh, concentrating on on the on the hands of the women because they started taking decisions regarding the education of their children and also even fertility. That kind of very uh, very important decisions have, as far as women is concerned. Uh, that that kind of changes started taking place. So, and uh, in general, the economic empowerment. Uh, that actually had uh, some very interesting uh, changes in the societal uh, scenario also. But some criticisms are also there uh, in the uh, in the in the scenario. Some people like big man and other people they attacked microfinance like anything because it is something like a neoliberal tool in order to uh, put the ideas of uh, capitalism into the mind of the people. That kind of uh, that kind of uh, uh, criticisms and attacks are there. And when there is a huge crisis, whether the women can tide over that crisis with the small loans they are getting, so that kind of questions are asked. Uh, and also in many of the cases, the loans will be there. Uh, in many of the many of the groups, when we talk to them, they do not need loans. So the money will be there because you know they can't engage in uh, the activities. Uh, because of their cultural constraints, because uh, they are supposed to be at home, they have to look after their children or old age, and the care economy plays a very important role, and they are supposed to take care of all those things, and they are not converting that funds into activities. So that kind of issues is there, and the entrepreneurship uh, that is also being hindered because of their basic issues as far as uh, the women are concerned, uh, they have the illiteracy uh, and we, all, we can also uh, see the management issues. When we go to the field, we can see that the, those who have taken uh, these loans, they start small shops or something like that. That is not viable in nature. And uh, many of them are, are not uh, running properly. That kind of issues are there. Uh, still, you know, uh, they are running it in order to make a living out of it. And at another uh, issue we can see in the field is that of uh, it couldn't reach the poorest of the poor. Naturally, when the money is there, uh, those who are a bit more, a uh, bit more uh, informed, and and those who are a bit more militant, they will be, uh, they will be snatching that kind of opportunities and and uh, and the and the benefits which are coming out of it. So the poorest of the poor is still being uh, being boosted from the whole system. That is a very, very serious concern as far as microfinance is concerned. Yeah. So now let me just move on to the uh, case of Kudumbashri. I think Aisha is working on it in a very deeper manner. I'm just giving a very brief account of that particular program. So when when I'm when I'm talking about self help groups, you can see different different hues and colors of uh, microfinancial institutions, especially uh, in in a big country like uh, like uh, India. 
but I am giving you a very interesting case of, of uh, uh, an institution which has been built by a subnational government. Okay, the government, what's the role of uh, the government in, in initiating these kind of issues, these kind of uh, uh, institutions, uh, especially for the women, and uh, that is based on solidarity economy methodology. Yes, so in 1997, the state government actually started, initiated uh, this uh, program, which is in order to alleviate the poverty at the, at the grassroots level. And later, uh, it has been used as a method or a tool in order to include the people who are from diverse uh, backgrounds, like transgenders, differently abled people, that kind of uh, methodologies or, or, or ideologies have been included in it. And you can see that in the table, which is there in the right-hand side of the slide, uh, it is federated also, because in the other grassroots level, uh, yes, uh, the energies that is, uh, uh, that is neighborhood groups are there or the self help groups are there. And these self help groups are autonomous unit. They have their own bank accounts. They have their own decisions. They have their own uh, their own um, enterprises or something like that. But they are not left uh, as such at the at the at the at the at the unit level. They are federated uh, to the high level. So that is actually helping that system uh, a bit more viable one. Because you know when you are federating it at higher level, you can take up. Uh, higher level activities, or you can scale up the activities in a in a in a larger manner. So some kind of bridging and bonding of social capital is happening at the at the at the local level, so that you know uh, that system has been beautifully built up over the years. So uh, a lot of activities like training activities, because you know if you want to give training, there must be some some number uh, of of people who has to be trained. So uh, that people can be pulled together and you can give the train. So uh, how many will be starting the enterprise? That is the second question, but you know, that much skill, skill uh, development and capacity building will be happening in each train. So that federated system is helping uh, in that manner. And we can see that about 4.6 4 million women are, are, are mobilized uh, at the, at the, uh, at the at the level, at the local level, so that you know they can come out and they can meet every week. They discuss a lot of things. They they engage in uh, different activities which are there at the at the at the local level, and they are a huge presence uh, in the local development of of the state of Kerala. So that is the impact of this kind of uh, collective, and uh, in that way, this kind of a state led initiative is helping uh, the development of a particular region. And when we look at the enterprises, because the enterprises are very interesting, uh, where uh, some of them are, you know, as I told earlier, when it is, uh, when it is federated, you can go for uh, some kind of consortiums, some kind of clustering, because it is, uh, it is very difficult to find the manufacturing and, and, and production kind of enterprises when we when we move to the uh, to the women enterprises they may they are supposed to do some trading or uh, or some kind of uh, consumption activity or something like that they may make some pickles or something like that but you know uh, are women capable of taking up the production activities that is the question uh, we i usually ask when i go to the uh, to the field yes they can because you know they come together and that federation and that consortium, uh, that kind of clustering that help them to uh, to take up some very challenging kind of activities, especially in a state like Kerala where industrial climate is very poor. Okay, so whether they are very much successful, that I uh, that I'm not uh, I'm not uh, uh, I'm not giving a very good uh, certificate for them. Still, you know, they are making some attempt. Okay, so likewise, uh, some production, consumption, interventions, likewise, likewise, the marketing interventions are also taking place. Very interesting uh, uh, example, which I tried to give a glance at the, at the earlier uh, stages of my presentation, is that of the collective farming, where the women come together, they take up the agricultural activities, which has been abandoned by the so-called farmers and so-called land owners and so on. And they, they are, they used to be just farmers. 
but now they are producers, they are managers, and they are taking up the activity in, 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 in the full length. So when I visited the field in Malapuram, uh, that, that uh, region is near to forest. So the monkeys and the, and the um, what, uh, elephant, the other wild animals will come and destroy the, destroy the, uh, the, the crops. So what they do, you know, they, they wake up and they, they try to ward off these wild animals. So in that manner, they en engage in that kind of activities. Yes, sometimes, you know, they say when we produce, we, we are not in a position to sell it. Uh, a woman from Alapura, they told me we, what we do when we, when we produce the vegetables, nobody will come and take up from our farm. So we take all these all this, uh, vegetables to the highway and we sell it at the highway. When women are selling it, people will come and buy it. Okay, so they, they invent a lot of new uh, uh, new ways in selling it, marketing it, making the networks and uh, getting the things done. So uh, you can see that around 25,000 hectares of the land has been uh, come under cultivation because of the collective, which has been initiated by uh, by uh, this uh, intervention. So let me put it in a, in a, in a nutshell and put it in evaluation. Yes, it has been started as an uh, as an uh, as a project in order to alleviate the absolute poverty in the state but at the same time you know uh, later it become an inclusive uh, kind of an organization if you go to uh, the plantation workers in Idiki or uh, scheduled tribes in Vainar, the women are, are 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 part of it yes there are some variations in the participation and also the impact is not uh, not same or equal across the regions still you know in, in regions like Manapura and also Alapura, Palakkad, Tushu, at that regions, there you can see a very, very, very interesting kind of results and impacts. And and I'm not saying that it is it is same across the regions. Still, you know that inclusive inclusivity is a very important thing, and they engage in a lot of activities, not only in agriculture, not only in manufacturing. Uh, they started doing some very innovative projects on health, social sector, the care economy, information uh, technology. They even started units to service the computers, laptops. So uh, they, they, uh, they just enter into different kinds of, uh, kinds of institutions. Even one of the, one of the groups, they start, even started a marriage bureau. One of my students, she did her uh, master's dissertation in that. So how a woman can, uh, conduct a marriage bureau with all the all the very uh, technologically advanced marriage bureaus are working uh, in in a state like Kerala. So uh, you can see uh, the women try to try to find some niche uh, areas in order to conduct their activities, and that itself is because of they are supported by a system which is there, and the collective force and the solidarity is is working at the grassroots level. And uh, when it comes to the uh, political participation uh, in Kerala, uh, we had a uh, very interesting experience experiment of decentralized plan. That is, you know, we have the plan funds. That is, we plan for five years. That is the way we usually uh, plan, and uh, thirty percent of each year's plan, plan fund is is uh, is given to the to the local governments. Okay, so the thirty percent means it's a huge chunk will be going to the different local self governments at the local for the local level development. So uh, when it comes to that part, uh, that decisions are taken at the at the gram sabhas. That is the people who come and decide what they need for the uh, for the local uh, local. Area. So I used to visit the grammar sabhas when I when I do my field work. So you can see that the grammar sabhas will be uh, around 80%, 90% will be women. So that kind of participation, that is, you know, you come and, and uh, talk about your local needs, uh, to whom uh, the toilets are needed, uh, where where should that, um, that drainage uh, pass through. That kind of decisions they, they make by discussing and they bring out the issues which are there at the local area. So the women started participating in the uh, in the local uh, local planning process, and that makes 
a huge difference uh, in the in the local areas. Yeah, and also uh, uh, in Kerala we have the fifty percent uh, reservation for women in the local self governments. So uh, one small data I have given over here in December twenty twenty, uh, around sixteen thousand, uh, around seventeen thousand women. They, they participated or they they contested for the elections. So that means you know the women uh, who are there in the in the visibility at the local level, they are they are naturally the members of these these organizations, and and around uh, one third of them got elected also. So these kind of changes we usually do not document, and we usually take it as a development process or something like that. We always think that the development is equal to how much uh, GDP has been increased or what is the growth rate. No, it is not like that. When you look at in a holistic manner, uh, this kind of participation and, and making the changes at the local level is much, much more uh, important. So let me conclude. So I think uh, I'm on time. I have five more minutes. I'll conclude very fast. Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, what I'm trying to say is that, yes, the ideas. Uh, that are individual in nature. Because you know, when it comes to solidarity, uh, when, you, when you move from one type of uh, solidarity economy to another type of uh, groups and other things, the idea changes from one, one, one group to another group. And how, how they solve the issues, how they resolve their conflicts, that is entirely different. So the innovative ideas, uh, uh, can be seen across the different types of solidarity economies which are there in India, in the concept of in in the in the context of cooperatives or mutual aid or any kind of solidarity economies which are working in the uh, in the local arena. And in many of the cases, the government's effort because government also has recognized solidarity economies as a as a uh, solution or a viable. Bible tool in order to solve a lot of problems which are there in the in the local level, especially in the financial markets, because financial market is very complex. Because uh, uh, a lot of people who are there in the financial markets uh, and 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 especially the formal financial institutions, they are looking at a very or uh, doing very very risk free business and so on. So these kind of methodologies are helping the women and the poor people who are marginalized. They can take take part in the in this kind of economies. And it is very surprising to find that there is a sustainable participation of the people. If the participation of the people is not there, if the, uh, if the enthusiasm dies down, naturally the solidarity economies cannot work for a very long time. And uh, as far as India is concerned, it's, uh, it's a solidarity economy sector is uh, concerned. The tradition of self-help, because we think that uh, the poor, the marginalized, they are not, not uh, they are very lazy or they are not trying to come out of their situations. But that is not true. They are trying to help themselves. And sometimes, you know, they are not in a position to come out of their situations when they are all alone. So that is the reason why they come together. So that is what we see in many of the situations in Manipura where I, where I did my field work as far as Kuvikalyam, another another uh, indigenous mechanism which we can see in it, see in the northern part of Kerala, where it is a it is a uh, uh, it is an indigenous way of crowdfunding. You give uh, small cheats to all the people, inviting everyone for a tea, uh, and everyone who comes for that uh, tea party will give a money, uh, and that will be recorded. So it is a crowdfunding that will be starting from nine o'clock in the morning, and it will. Uh, end at 7, 7 p.m. at night. So by that time, they raise something around 10 lakhs of rupees, that is uh, 100,000 uh, into 10. That much money they raise for some particular purpose. So that kind of community crowdfunding kind of things, because you know they know how to, how to help themselves. So the tradition of self-help is very much there in the, uh, in the global south, especially among the marginalized sections. And that is actually actually founded and invented by the people, and they nurture it. They don't want it to die away, and they bring forward and also uh, they embrace all the varieties of uh, solidarity economies which are there at the at the local settings. And also uh, we can see 
that when we talk to them, that help them to tie them at, at times of crisis and that actually they are keeping it uh, close to their heart, even if there are some inherent issues which are there inside. So that that is actually uh, alternative ways of, of making the development happen at the local areas uh, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the scenario of global south. But there are some challenges. I'm not utilizing all those things. Uh, as a as a uh, researcher, I must look into the whole uh, whole issues which are there underlying in these kind of institutions, and they are under threat, especially in the modern uh, modern era, where uh, the formalization. Everybody thinks that formalization is the is the answer for all the problems which are there in these kind of institutions. Some some of them may become different after some time because of the internal issues which could, couldn't be resolved by the people. And uh, some some uh, uh, some kind of institutions, they have very low resource base or capital base that make them to uh, uh, have some sustainability issues in the long run. And also when it comes to the women groups, uh, there are some challenges as well as uh, empowerment is concerned because many feminist economists, they are uh, challenging some of the methodologies which are followed by these kind of uh, groups. And uh, they say that it is actually reinforcing the patriarchal norms into the into the society. And naturally, the political allegations are there because you know, naturally when people come together, politics, uh, uh, the political parties and the Western interests, they have some interest on, on that and they may pollute the whole, uh, whole scenario. Still, you know, while I'm always uh, very much uh, very much optimistic about uh, all these institutions, yes, uh, this must this this kind of institutions must uh, must be must be taken forward and and should there should be a very very uh, very good future. Uh, we must be we must be very much you know, very much focused to the sustainability as well as the long term changes which which has to be uh, taken place at the local level. So with these words, I'd like to convert. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's very rich uh, presentation about the about the ideas and that she found me. Sometimes you have some other Yeah. Uh -huh. We still have some people. Yeah. So, so yeah. shall I? Uh, yeah, we can take out that uh, point from it. We we um yeah I guess we can open all questions and Salman Mohammed any question from Vice any questions Isha yes I should. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 it's just amazing, right? It, it, you know, when you talk about solidarities and economies. Yeah. <laughs> Oops, thank you. Uh, I'm curious, like, you, you talk about when you say that like, the self-help uh, groups are mostly 
like women. What about Rosca? I mean, is that also strictly women kind of dominance or women play or rather so have men? Yeah. yeah. Oscars oh, yeah. are run by both men and women. I think in some settings. Okay. Uh, especially uh, in very local areas, women are more active in that kind of process. But when it comes to the formal kind of things, you know, when it becomes more formalized, when the money is poured, naturally men will be uh, the members of that. But if the money is very less, okay, if it is 1,000 rupees a month, you are putting it, so you'll be getting, if there are 12 members, you'll get only 12,000 rupees when, when, that, uh, when you, you, your turn comes. But for that small amount of money, the men may not be that much interested. They are interested in big money. So they will be uh, paid some kind of uh, a bit of more for when it becomes more and more formal, the participation of women will come down. Uh, if it is highly informal, yeah. the, uh, the participation of women will be very high. So that is what we can find. Do the government have kind of the regulation? So yes, yes. Because you know, because of some some kind of uh, default cheating, that kind of uh, issues are coming up. Uh, there are some regulations on place, but there is a separate act for Roskas in India and also in Kerala. A set of regulations are there. It should be conducted in this manner only. If it is not conducted in this manner, it will be considered as some kind of money laundering business. So it is regulated in that sense. If you are running a formal business, but at the at the ground level, uh, still now the informal postcards are going on, and it is uh, we can call it as very hidden kind of institutions that is there. No one is uh, bothered about what is do, happening. Does the government regulate the rate and interest rate that you know, to that those rules? Yeah, it's not the interest; it is the commission. Okay. What is the commission yeah. that uh, facil facilitator can take, and what should be the mm, amount? That kind of things they regulate. It should not go beyond some amount. That kind of things they regulate, and it should be audited. The government will send their auditors into it. How much money is mobilized? What what for what they are using? That kind of uh, very strict regulations are there. If it is enough formalized. Demand, Again, within a letter comma, <laughs> because that <laughs> regulations will go only to the formal sector. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you. This is informative, and I really appreciate the nuance you brought to sort of uh, the context of how uh, um, it comes uh, about. It's definitely not like a one size fits all kind of yeah. you know framework. So I really appreciated that. Um, I wanted to ask, so I guess some of the Roscas that deal with uh, a little bit less money that have, I guess, more uh, women involved and also some of the self-help group, like on one hand, I see the way in which they they uh, commune their, their money together and, and the way that the, the solidarity sort of finances are, are working as like, when you were talking, as kind of like a restructuring of, a, a financial uh, grouping that's outside of like heteropatriarchal norms in a particular way that's not within the nuclear family and I found that really sort of really interesting but then you did mention that there's ways in which that um, it's seen as a reinforcement of patriarchal norms in some uh, discourses so I wondered if you could like elaborate a little bit on that um, what what um and what examples is this seen as something that um, reproduces uh, hetero? Like, I think you mentioned that, you know, in the Roscats, when it's at a higher level, then the men kind of jump in. Uh, but if there's other sort of examples that kind of uh, highlight that. Yeah, the norms, traditions, that play a very important role when it comes to the informal institutions. Because uh, different types of social organizations are working at the ground level like religious institutions are there, communal institutions are there. So they have uh, their own 
uh, rules and norms and traditions in order to run these kind of institutions. For example, at the end of the presentation, I mentioned about a crowdfunding kind of uh, institution. Actually, it is not based on, you, you will be amazed to see that uh, uh, it is not run by any religious institution. It is not run by any uh, any uh, community institutions. The whole community takes part in it. But they have a very strict uh, way of uh, keeping the records. They keep it in, they write it away. Still, you know, that that is in a, uh, that is in a very strict manner, they follow it. And in the next round, they bring all the records. Then they use that base documents in order to uh, conduct the next round of crowdfunding activities. So that is based on the, the tradition uh, because that people, they need this kind of systems because they can't just go to the bank and get the, uh, get the loans whenever they are in need because the banks will ask you 100 documents uh, especially if you feel if the bank feels that you are not credit worthy, uh, then the bank may reject your loan application. But here, the assurance is there. Okay, if you go and uh, get the things done, you are you you have the money at the end of the day. So they want to keep it running at the local level. So the, so that kind of institutions they do not want to get it formalized. But the governments are a bit skeptical about all these things. What are they doing? How much money they are uh, they are mobilizing? Whether there is any money laundering activities are going on? Whether the black money is getting white or something like that? That kind of discussions are, are going on parallelly. Still, you know, the communities are uh, are running these kind of institutions. Yet another institution I studied is that of uh, it's a credit union. The credit unions in Western context is something very big, but this is a very small kind of uh, institution where uh, uh, some 50,000 people are engaged in. That's a small region and that people are still running that, that credit unit. The basic idea is that there are collectors. The collector will come to your home every week. Whatever savings you, you have with you, maybe 50 rupees or 100 rupees, you give to the collector. Collector records in the passbook. That passbook, you will keep it with you. But uh, you know, whenever you feel like having uh, some money uh, withdrawn, you can you can ask the collector to uh, give that money. So it is a very very informal kind of a thing. Still, you know, there is some trust going on between the collector and the and the members who are uh, involved in the in the whole. You are, the basic thing is you know it, it, you are taking back your savings, but your savings is in a in safe custody with someone else. So that is the that is you know very, very interesting kind of a system, which is happening there for 40, 50 years, and still it is going on. Even if a lot of lot of government uh, coming into and looking into their records and that kind of things are happening, still uh, they are running it because they need that system. Yeah, the tradition, the custom, and they, they keep it. That is what I usually say that the people only nurture it. They only bringing it forward. They're keeping it yeah. because they, they are in need of that. They can go uh, to any other other person and get the money whenever they need. And it's ironic that you know media, the politicians are talking about corruption, and it's sure like any any institution that has power has the the uh, can fall to corruption. So it's like it's ironic that the the media and the government is pointing yes. fingers. You know, the, yeah, because yeah. they need sensational news. Right. Right. But I uh, never think from the point of view of the people who are involved in all these kind of businesses. Why they are involved in that business? They, that question they never ask because development is different for different kinds of people. For them, you know, sometimes, you know, building a small house may be their way of uh, uh, what, uh, going up uh, to the development ladder, something like that. No, no, the mobility, what we call uh, that. For them, that may be the biggest dream in their life. So these institutions are helping them to uh, achieve that uh, dreams or aims or aspirations. So they are keeping it uh, intact at the local. That is what I always feel. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. I, I, don't, I don't have any 
questions as such. <laughs> yeah, <sorry. laughs> yeah. Just to add to like what you were saying, like about the patriarchal norms. It it again, you know, as she mentioned, or you know, I think it changes for women to women, society to society, you know, the Western mm -hmm. context when you see patriarchal norms, whether it's but still there are scholars in Canada who uh, strongly criticize Kutubashri interventions, particularly uh, saying that women are abused as mere, like I'm talking about Kutubashri, like the five mm -hmm. common intervention. Women are at, at times used as mere shock absorbers, you know, for women, uh, 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 women's affective labor, positive, uh, uh, particularly women's emotional labor has been, uh, needs to be recognized, and that is something that this kind of uh, you know, misused through some of these. Things. You cannot say misused would be a very hard word. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, need to be recognized, and you know, that this kind of labor is actually used in some of these interventions. But for, as a researcher, when I studied Kudukashi, what I felt that's very important to look at these interventions, as as you mentioned, with the perspectives of these women. You know, what it means for them. <laughs> you know, rather than us discussing in these intellectual circles, you know, about patriarchy and what works for them <laughs> and what works uh, in these universities or academicians or us is very different, you know. <laughs> well, yeah, and I asked because it seems they have so much agency, right? So yeah. I was so confused at like, what it is that they're, what's the critique, right? They have, and they, they're building communities other women like that's wonderful yeah yeah yes uh as, as i was trying to say the politicians they make use of their labor even the right. capitalist ideologies pushed down to the uh, women that kind of things are there but when we go to them and looking from their point of view the whole things change yes, yes. please um, yes, and thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Oh, Mohammed, just audio. Uh, right, can you hear ahead. me? Yeah, now, now, yeah, you are audible. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for your talk, um, Dr. Krista Bell. Um, although um, technology um, did not allow us <laughs> online to get um, the better part of your presentation, but um, I would say that um, it is a very rich um, work um, you are doing, um, bringing um, through your research um, a, a deeper understanding um, of uh, these processes on, on the ground. Um, I um, can see some examples in the African context and specifically in Sierra Leone where I am coming from. I know that there is a, an informal grassroots initiatives by women called Osusu, yeah. where um, um, women at the local community level would identify among them leaders that they will be the primary collector um, of a certain um, amount of money and they will re rotate um, the overall sum of the money from one person to the other. Uh, what is really um, fascinating about such initiative, as um, you've laid out in your presentation, is the um, the solidarity and the trust um, in within these initiatives um, that um, often um, makes it possible um, to um, sustain it over a long period of time and to expand it. Um, and and, and I, I see a lot of parallel there. Uh, my, my question, uh, maybe you spoke to this um, while we are having technological difficulty, has to do with uh, the neoliberal economy. Uh, you mentioned that um, some of this has to do with um, tradition, um, indigenous um, and practices um, that are within these communities. Uh, but my question is, to which extent um, what we are seeing um, is a function of the neoliberal economy, uh, which, um, as you know, is one that um, emphasizes privatization, formalization, but also marginality, marginalizing um, certain categories of people. So is it is it just indigenous and tradition, or it has something to do with the neoliberal economy? Okay, wonderful question. Yeah. <laughs> See, uh, 
I, I try to map uh, some of the institutions. Uh, it can be uh, informal in nature, totally informal in nature, and also uh, the the newer forms, that is the government initiated Purvashri or the private institutions uh, who are running the microfinancial activities. Yes, uh, there are different shades of uh, solidarity economies in in almost all the all the all the areas in global south. That is what my uh, what 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 I understand, especially in India. So uh, especially if it is going uh, too much informal. If it is uh, if it is informal, naturally the norms and traditions will play a very important role. But when it becomes more and more formal, and the government comes in, some regulations are there. Naturally, uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's method or methodology as well as the way of delivery that will change. So uh, people, as as Aisha was trying to say, some people, some intellectuals, they are they are saying that it is. It is uh, a neoliberal uh, ideology is working in, in it and you know you are, you are mobilizing funds from them, uh, the savings, uh, the small savings which are there with the women, it is captured by the banks, that kind of, uh, that kind of uh, criticisms are there. Still, you know, if we interview these people, if we go and talk to these people, they say that these are the only mechanisms available with them. Yeah, no one is there to help them. The financial institutions or the governments or the politicians, no one is there to help them. They have to set the, help themselves. So whatever institutions come comes to them in one way or another way, they have to rely on them. There is no other way. That is the reason why in, in states like Andhra Pradesh or Karnataka, the private financial institutions are making a huge amount of money because of the women. Because the other institutions are not uh, not reaching out to the women or the women can't access to the formal financial institutions. So uh, they never give money to a single woman. That is very, very, <laughs> uh, very uh, uh, tricky in nature or they are very clever in nature. They, they ask the women, if you need money, you bring 10 people together. We will make a group. They give, give a name to that group. They, they start, a, uh, start a, an account uh, with that group. Then they will give money and they extract the money in a very, very uh, using a lot of harassment and so on. So uh, it is their situation that actually make them to do all those things. Okay, so whatever institutions are coming to them, they are they are in a position to uh, take up that. So that is one way. It is some kind of helplessness. That is what I always say. So. Actually, last year, August, when I was uh, when I was interviewing some of the women, I feel very bad about them. They are over indebted. They said that I took money sixty thousand from here, seventy thousand from here, seventy five thousand from here. When I, when that guy is giving more pressure, I'll get 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 more money, more loan from here, and 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 cross that line. So they cross finance. That kind of things are happening. That's true. Still, you know, where will uh, they go? If this one is not there, that is the big question we do have. Even if we are, we are talking about a lot of development initiatives, development programs, financial inclusion, and so much, the women are still excluded from the government and financial institutions. So they have to rely on what is available to them at the local level. <laughs> I don't know whether I have answered the question properly to Mohammed. <laughs> uh, you did. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mamad, for being with us. <laughs> interesting. Obviously, you know, we've had in the society for many, many years, right? Okay, woman, that's the position for women here. And then now, you know, that's for men. And then now, women can. And make some money and, and get more involved in economic activities. Yes. And, and especially when you talk about the collective family through uh, batteries, I think it's, it's amazing. So, yes. how, so, yeah, women can mobilize and themselves, work together. And, yeah. I want to play you know, in, in that situation, like, <laughs> it's like, so there's some, I read some articles about like how men, 
they they have tried to bring their home uh, their wife back like not involved they, they do not yeah, that allow the wife is involved in those activities and you know in those guy what they want to do yeah, that mm. kind of conflicts will be there. Yeah. They don't know in a household, the power dynamics play, will be playing a, an important role. But these women, they are able to come out of that to some extent. Still, you know, they. I'm not saying that it is a very, very smooth kind of a transition. No, they are struggling at their household level. You know, when I when I did my field work, even in the early 2000s, I find that the women sometimes take triple burden. It is not the double burden. They will be looking at the uh, at the household uh, activities. They have to do all the things. Then they go for the enterprise. Then again, you know, they need to uh, take part in the community activities also. Uh, they need to go to all the meetings on time. So, so much stress is there from them. Yeah, still, you know, they are managing and they are, they are trying to be part of it. That is the most important thing. Still, that much burden and that much stress is there. So there must be something, uh, you know, uh, that institutions are giving to the women in a very positive manner. That's why they are still there. Otherwise, they will leave the institution and go away, run away from that. Yeah. Imagine it's a lot yeah. more Yes. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah, let's see. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.